Thank you, John, and thank you, our choir orchestra, worship team. That was, that was really great. Thank you so much. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 15 today. Turn with me to Luke chapter 15. And I'm just, I'm really glad to be here with you, honored to be here, and uh, just thankful for, for you all and just for the grace that you've continually showed my family and I as we've come to be uh, guests here and get to share in ministry with you all. Uh, today is Father's Day. But I want to start by talking about superheroes, okay? So I'm a big superhero fan. Uh, if you've got a favorite superhero, raise your hand. If you, just, if you like superheroes, you've got a favorite, right? My favorite superhero is Superman. Uh, now, I know he's a, the favorite of many, but mine is Superman. But really, Superman's story is interesting because Superman gets a lot of attention, right? He's got the powers. He's the one that flies and saves people and... And uh, the comic book has his name on the front, Superman. But I think the real hero of Superman's story is actually Jonathan Kent. So Superman's secret identity is Clark Kent. And his dad is Jonathan. And Jonathan, his dad is the one who raised him. He's the one who taught him, not just, I mean, he didn't have the powers to teach him superpowers. But Jonathan guided Clark, guided Superman and really guided him to be the person he was. So to me, Jonathan Kent, Superman's dad, is the real hero of the story. And today on Father's Day, we're going to look at a, at a, at a part of the, the scripture where the son gets a lot of attention too, but I think the father is the real hero, is the real star of the story. We're going to look at what we know as the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. We're going to be in verses 11 through 32. However, I agree with Daryl Brock who writes in the NIV application commentary that this is really the parable of the forgiving father. Because we learn so much about the love of God from the father in this parable that Jesus teaches. The father is the real hero of this story. And today I want, to see this, I want us to see this key truth as we look at the scriptures today that as fathers, we must lead our families with the steadfast love of God the Father, a love that leads us home. We're going to see that today in this story. Again, as we know it as the parable of the prodigal son, but I really think it's the parable of the forgiving father. Let's read together in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And Jesus says this, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. There he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. We're going to stop there for now. We'll keep going in just a minute. But we're going to see how, as fathers, we must lead with this steadfast love of God the Father. A love that leads us home. And we're going to examine the love of the Father in this parable and see how this is really the hero of the story, this love of the Father. And the first thing that we see is that when we are set to leave, the love of the Father is slow to anger. Now, these are all going to have the word S. Jeff told me when I came, they all have to start with the same letter or I wouldn't be invited back, right? I think that's like, that's Greek. Guru in Greek means you start everything with the same letter, right? Okay, so, um, 
So the first thing we see is when we are set to leave, the Father, the love of the Father is slow to anger. Now notice here, this parable begins with a scene. The younger son comes to his father and he says, I want my inheritance now. I want what's coming to me. I want to take it now and leave. And the father, he didn't have to, he doesn't have to give this request to his son, but he does so anyway. Now the younger son, he gets one third of the inheritance and the older son gets two thirds. So the younger son gets what he's, he's asking for and the father who is being patient with his son gives him the inheritance. The father doesn't have to do this. The father could have dismissed him and said no. But he's patient with his son. He knows his son is ready to leave anyway. And so he's patient with him. He's slow to anger. And he allows him to learn from this experience. The younger son showing incredible disrespect to his father in this moment. He's basically telling his father, I don't want to wait for you to die to get my money. I want my money now. He's basically saying, you know what, I really wish you were dead. And his father, instead of dismissing him or just kicking him out completely, I'm sure with a grieved heart, gives in to his son's request. Now this part of the parable is not prescriptive. It's not teaching us to just let our kids do whatever they want. Rather, we see the patience of the father. The son's already out the door. He's leaving no matter what. And so the father has patience and love for his son. This part of the story is all about God the Father loving us through disappointing times and being patient as we make mistakes. And this is really setting the foundation. This is setting the tone for the son to return later. His slow to anger love is setting that up. And God is patient with you and with me. In passages like 1 Corinthians 13, we see Paul even write that love is patient. Now I know when I say the word patience or being patient, many of you may start to squirm. Because being patient is not always the easiest thing for us, is it? Even the way that our world is today, patience is not a virtue anymore. We want it now. We want it ready to go. We are not very patient people. Honestly, it's hard to be patient just on our own. Some of you may have that gifting, but many of us, like myself, don't. This is something when I read about patience, I just don't think I can do it. And honestly, I can't on my own. Patience is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It's a fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit works in our lives to produce. It's something that I can't muster up on my own consistently. If you ever feel like it's difficult to be slow to anger then you know what I mean. Only the Holy Spirit can lead us this way. And this really starts when we live our lives in prayer. So the the first thing that we're going to see as far as what we can do in response to the learning about the love of God the Father is if we want to be fathers who lead our families with the steadfast love of God, then we must pray. I want to read you this this, um, this story about a man named James Hugh O'Neill. James Hugh O'Neill was an American Catholic priest who served as the chaplain for the United States Army from 1926 to 1952. He, ser- he served under George S. Patton. Now, he rose to the rank of Brigadier General, and while he was the, he was the chaplain, the, the army was going through the Battle of the Bulge, and he composed this famous weather prayer that the soldiers would pray so they could have good weather as they were fighting. You may be familiar with that story. But he writes, Hugh O'Neill writes this essay that talks about a discussion that he had with General Patton. Patton, of course, asked him to write this weather prayer, but he also wanted more than that. He wanted his men to be men of prayer. Patton said this, Chaplain, I am a strong believer in prayer. There are three ways that men get what they want. By planning, by working, and by praying. Any great military operation takes careful planning or thinking. Then you must have well-trained troops to carry it out. That's working. But between the plan and the operation, there's always an unknown. That unknown spells defeat or victory, success or failure. 
It is the reaction of the actors to the ordeal when it actually comes. Some people call that getting the breaks. I call it God. God has his part or margin in everything. And that's where prayer comes in. Up to now, the third army, God has been very good to us. We've never retreated. We've never suffered defeats, no famine, no epidemics. This is because a lot of people back home are praying for us. We were lucky in Africa, in Sicily, and Italy, simply because people prayed. But we have to pray for ourselves too. And this is where I think he nails it. A good soldier is not made merely by making him think and work. There is something in every soldier that goes deeper than thinking or working. It's his guts. It is something that he has built in there. It is a world of truth and power that is higher than himself. Great living is not all, not all output of thought and work. A man has to have intake as well. Patton recognized that the men in the army, he wanted them to be, to be men of prayer. To have that power outside of themselves that would go along with the planning and the working they did to face the battle. Because he knew that there's things that we just can't do on our own, but only God can do in us. And if we want to be patient and, have, and be, have a love that is slow to anger, we must be people of prayer. The second thing that we see about the love of Father today is that when we are selfish, the love of the Father is selfless. When we are selfish, the love of the Father is selfless. Now, the son goes off and he eventually spends all of his money. All right? He lives it up. He spends it all, and he finds himself in a difficult place. A famine hits the land. He can't, find a really, he can't really find a job. He ends up living in a pigsty. He's literally in the muck. And he finds himself in a very difficult place. But when he's in that muck, w- when he's in a place that, and again, this is a detail that we can't miss. Jesus talks about pigs. When he's living with the pigs, and for Jewish people, they would hear this, and it would always be like a <gasps> kind of a moment when they'd be shocked to hear anyone living in that kind of environment because of their rules against pork. So this son is living in the worst possible place and he remembers who his dad is. He remembers the people that worked for his dad and how good of a life that they had. He said even these people had enough, more than enough bread. He remembers the selfless nature of his father. It was very common for people like the father in this story to have servants and to have wealth and have an estate but not treat their servants very well. In fact, God would often in the Old Testament rail against people who were treating others unjustly, who had servants, who had land but were taking advantage of other people. But this father in this story is not that way. He is selfless. He's reflecting the love of God through the way that he treats other people. And the son remembers this selfless love. And it turns his heart back home. The selfless love that the father had was planting the seeds in the heart of his son to come back home. And like a seed planted in the ground... Sometimes it takes a long time to do anything. And sometimes it takes some fertilizer, much like what the son was living in at the time. But still, we see the son helps us see that when when the seeds of selflessness are planted in someone's heart, eventually they sprout and it turns his heart back home. Being selfless is not just sharing money or things. It's an outpouring of God's love from our hearts. It demonstrates the reality of our love. And sometimes being selfless can also help experience the real love of the Father because we are living like Him. And if we want to be fathers who lead our families with the steadfast love of God, we must sow the seeds of Christ's selfless love to our families so that they can see that love in action. I love how earlier in the service that we read Philippians chapter 2, and it's, it's just an incredible passage where Paul's describing the nature of Jesus and how he was selfless and how he served us. I want to read that just quickly again. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And Jesus gives his life He steps down out of glory to be selfless, to show the love of God 
in human form so that we could be made right again. We must plant the seeds of selfless love in the hearts of our families. I see this so often in my wife who loves to make food and and bless people around us, especially the people in our our neighborhood. And it's not always convenient. It's not always, uh, it takes time, it takes money. But our girls have grown up seeing how my wife has led us to bless other people around us. Many years ago, we spent a Christmas just taking gifts to our neighbors all around us, just to show them love. And I see that as the girls grow up, as my, as my daughters grow, those seeds that have been planted in their hearts start to blossom and they start to show that selfless love as well. We must do the same. We must sow the seeds of selfless love in our families. Third, we see that when we are scattered, the love of the Father is steadfast. When we are scattered, the love of the Father is steadfast. So the son, he comes home. And this, this is the apex of the parable here. This is the shining light of God's love. Because even though the son was faithless, the father was faithful. And John, I loved how you, you mentioned that in your prayer too. That even though we are not faithful, God never fails. He is always faithful. He is steadfast. The son scattered his soul, his money, his heart, everything he had all over the far country. But the steadfast love of God, of the Father, was never wavered. When the Son comes close, the Father sees him. And the Son's prepped. He's prepped his, his speech, right? He's, he's ready to, 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 to go back into the house. He knows his dad doesn't have to let him back in. He knows that his dad doesn't even have to let him come be a servant. So he's trying his best to crawl and come back and say, just let me work for you, that's all I ask. But what does the father do? When he sees his son, he doesn't wait for his son to get back. He doesn't let his son crawl. The father takes off running after his son. A very important detail in the story. For a man like this to run is very undignified. Men in his position, in the father's position, they don't run. They don't take off after their children like he did. But his steadfast love, his faithful love, pushed him and it led him to embrace his son and welcome him back in. What we see here in the Father, in this parable, is God's chesed, his steadfast love. Say that word with me, chesed. Uh, no, you knew better than that, come on, chesed. You've got, to, you've got to get, no, you can do better. You can get down here, get down, che, chesed. Uh, that's, that may be a little too good, okay? Watch, you might have to wipe the back of your head off, chesed. That word chesed, it's a Hebrew word. A lot of Hebrew words have that in it, okay? And I know it's allergy season, a lot of cottonwood flying around. It's easier to do that now than other parts of the year. But the Hebrew word chesed, we see it 245 times in the Bible. It's a Hebrew word that describes the steadfast love of God. It describes his steadfast love, his mercy, or undeserved acts of kindness towards his people. It's hard for me to even stand up and explain it to you because it's such a deep word. It's, it, it's a word that's hard to describe because God's love is so steadfast and loyal and faithful that we can't just describe it by one word. You may see it in your Bible as faithful love or loving kindness. Maybe it's steadfast love. Sometimes it's just mercy. Like in Psalm 23 when it says, your goodness and your mercy will follow me all of my days. That word mercy is hesed. And that, the picture of that in that, in that psalm that, we, that we're very familiar with is God's love chasing us down, not just following after us, like he's walking behind us, but it's chasing us down like a lion going after a gazelle. That's the chesed, the chesed love of God. Through this powerful parable, Jesus displays the love of God the Father, and this is the love that he desires for us to show. And honestly, I am very intimidated by that. I don't know if I can love like that. That is so deep and so rich so unconditional 
And honestly, I can't. And honestly, you can't. But that's the beauty of God's love, is that even though we can't in our weakness, even though we fall short, God loves us anyway, and He wants to work in us to do the best that we can. That's why our relationship with Him is so important. That's why it's so important to have a real relationship with God, because if we want to show this kind of love to our families and to the people around us, we have to spend time with God for Him to work in us to do that. And if we want to be fathers who lead our families with the steadfast love of God, then we must be men of the Word. And this is for, this is for fathers, mothers, for anyone. We must be men and women of the Bible. We must spend our time in the Bible consistently so that we can spend time with God and let Him transform us, transform our hearts to love like He does. We can't do it on our own. We can't just muster it up on our own. We've got to spend time with Him and it starts here. We have to have a real relationship with God. Now we understand this, right? You guys have probably heard the, the phrase, you are the company you keep. You become like the people that you're around. And if you doubt that at all, I'm sure if you're, if you're close to my age, you've had moments when you're like, wow, I just became my father. When you grew up thinking that, that, that your mom and dad didn't know that much, then all of a sudden you have a couple of kids and then you find yourself, you're like, oh man, I just became my dad. And you're just like, oh. Because you spend so much of your life with your parents. And, if you, and then when you get married, you spend so much of your life with that person, you start to become like them as well. And then the people you're around, you become like the company you keep. And if we want to love like God loves, we've got to spend time with him. And not just going to Sunday school and going to church on Sunday morning, but daily spending time with God. That's how we'll love like Him. That's how we become like Him. And I want you to know that as I challenge you with that this morning, I challenge myself with that as well. Because as much as these qualities that, that, that the Bible shows us about God, I feel like every day I just fall short. But spending time with Him helps me to become more like Him every day. Finally, in this parable we see that when we are sorrowful, the love of the Father is sufficient. We're going to look at the last few verses of this. The sons come home. They're having a party. But then the, the focus of the story turns to the brother, the older son. In verse 25 it says this, Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music. And dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property and with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, the father says this, Son, you were always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now the older son in this parable He's representing the Pharisees that at, the, at the beginning of this chapter in Luke were grumbling about Jesus spending time with sinners. And Jesus is trying to teach them through portraying the older son in this way. Because the older son's upset. He's mad that his younger brother got what he wanted, lived it up, lost it all, and came home. And instead of getting his due reward, he gets celebrated for coming home. And the older brother can't believe it. Because he's lived his life trying to do all the right things, trying to do everything he can. And yet his father has never celebrated him, is what he thinks. But the father, again, in this moment, when he could have, he could have come down on his son very harshly, instead teaches him the gospel. Teaches him the good news of Jesus that what Jesus wants us to have is not what we deserve. 
our sin, our failures, even the best that we could do to try and get to God, it falls short. We don't deserve the love of God. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve this relationship that God has with us. But yet Jesus, in his love and his mercy, he paid the price on the cross so that we could be made right with God and live in heaven with him, to pay the price for our sin. And the Father is teaching the Son in this moment the gospel. That you've tried to do all the right things, but the love of God is sufficient. It's sufficient for all that we need. If we want to be fathers who lead our families with the steadfast love of God, then we must teach and show our children the good news of Jesus. We must teach our families the gospel. The world today is screaming at our families and our kids, telling them what they need, telling them what's, what's right, trying to tell them the news. It's not even hidden anymore. It used to be more subtle. But if we don't teach our families about the gospel, someone will teach them a fake one. As our kids have gotten older and hear more and more about this, we have realized that we can't guard them from all the lies that are out there. Me, I'm kind of a helicopter dad sometimes, and I, I want to, I get very protective. I've got three girls, and I get very protective sometimes, and I, and I, I just want to shield them from all the things that might teach them lies out in the world. But I can't do that anymore. Even if I tried my hardest, I could not do that anymore. Even if I took my family, dug a bunker, put us in there, and shut the doors with no TV or no, no television, I'm sure some way someone's going to get an advertisement in there and try to tell us what the truth really is. What we can do and what we must do is teach them the truth that overcomes the lies of the enemy, that overcomes the lies of the world. Not only does it teach them about how to have a real relationship with Jesus, but it tells them how to share that truth, the truth of God's love with others. We must teach our families and show them the gospel. Now, listen, I'm nowhere near perfect none of us are perfect mothers or fathers or families and as hard as we might try we'll never raise perfect families or perfect kids but we see the the goal of today what we're striving for is 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 the steadfast love of god and the fact that i can't do it is actually a freeing thought it's a freedom from the burden that it's all on me. But it's the work of God within me, within you, within us as families. I'm going to invite John and our team back up to, to prepare for our time of response. But a love like this from God, it comes from being slow to anger, selfless, steadfast, and sufficient. All these qualities come from a real relationship with God. A real relationship with God the Father. Really following Jesus and spending time with the Holy Spirit every day. He's the one who can lead us the best fathers and mothers and leaders of our family. The response today is simple. Come home to the Father. As the love of the Father in this parable led his son to return home, we must return to the Father. Maybe you're like the older son in this, in this parable and you've been trying hard your whole life to do the right things and, and to be the best person you can be. But it falls short of the righteousness of God. You have a relationship with God in your head but not in your heart. And God's saying, come home, start a real relationship with me today. Maybe today you need to give your heart and your life to Jesus. Maybe you have a relationship with God, but it's a Sunday to Sunday kind of thing. You don't really spend time with Him. The love of God isn't shown in your life because you've never experienced it for yourself. Maybe today you just need to come forward and spend some time with 
with um, our staff guys who are going to be up here and just, just pray and say, God, help me to spend more time with you to lead my family like you would lead me. And finally, maybe you want to take and gather your family and just come down here and pray and commit to learning and living out the gospel day in and day out. That's our response today. We're going to have some guys up front who, are, who will be here if you want someone to pray with or the altar will be open. And as we sing, I want to invite you to come and respond to how God may be calling you today. Let's stand and pray together and then we're going to sing and have a time of response. Father, we're so grateful that you love us in ways that we can't even understand. That you are faithful even when we are not. That you are close when we try to run far away. God, help us to not only see that love, but experience it in our lives and show it to others, to our families, to the people around us. And God, forgive me and forgive us where we fail you, where we fall short of this. And Holy Spirit, may you work in our lives to help us to love and lead like you. If there's someone here today, God, that needs to know you for the first time, I pray that you would call them so they would give their heart and life to you today. In your name.